My name is Mike Noel. I'm the CEO for a company called Blockchain Consultants. Um, we do uh, smart contracts and rationalized workflows for small businesses. Um, I'm also the host for this thing, this thing that we are beginning to call Blockchain Weekly. And if you're here, uh, prepare to waste another perfectly good hour talking about all things blockchain. Uh, we tend to uh, talk about things that revolve around smart contracts, things uh, that revolve around interesting things uh, that you can do with blockchain, as opposed to speaking about speculation and the, the cost of a specific uh, coin and how coins are going. Um, we believe that uh, in the grand scheme of things, 10 years from now, if, if you're able to look at uh, the market cap value of all the coins, it's going to be a very large amount. Uh, but if you look at the market cap of all the value of all the things that we know as smart contracts, uh, you're not going to be able to look at something of that nature, but you'll be able to understand what it is probably. So if you look at the things that are, are called smart contracts and what the value is and what the enterprise value of all the companies that this is powering and things of this nature, it's going to be a massive, massive, massive amount. And right now we believe or have believed for quite some time that there were some interesting things happening with distributed ledger, interesting things we could do, um, and felt that uh, not a lot of folks were focusing on that. A lot of the, the, the speculation over Bitcoin and you know pricing and what's going on there. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know if you guys have gone through the cold and, and the flu season, but uh, we're we're still doing that here in Phoenix, Arizona. So um, trying to recover a little bit, and I do apologize. But anyway, um, uh, what, what we're finding is that our beliefs as far as the value of smart contracts and the value of these other things that um, uh, that uh, Vitalik has put together is much bigger. And, and we're starting to see some things like, um, uh, what is it? Uh, the transformational power and potential of the blockchain is only beginning to be understood. Uh, while it is most commonly associated with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency applications, the blockchain is capable of so much more. Future applications such as smart complex, smart contracts, supply chain solutions, food safety, even applications for healthcare on the horizons as we put life in the blockchain. This is uh, a, a new um, article on Seeking Alpha from Jane Edmondson. Thank you very much, Jane, for the article. I, I, I read it and found it very enlightening, very uh, interesting. Lots of things happening in blockchain. And now some of the people are, are starting to come back around. Um, uh, computer world. This is computer world. This is once, you know, what I think once we hit computer world, it's kind of like the masses are coming to the, to the market. Um, uh, computer world writes, while the full potential of blockchain may not be understood by business execs, that's not keeping companies from aggressively exploring how the secure distributed ledger technology can save time and money. So executives aren't really understanding what the consequences are, what it can, what the capabilities are. But there's people out there that are beginning to um, uh, uh, that are beginning to to realize that and beginning to put that in, in, into uh, um, uh, into action. And I've got a guy that uh, we're interviewing today, Eric. I, I can't wait to get to you, brother. I can't wait to get to you. Uh, because this is going to be an interesting session of Blockchain Weekly as we talk to Eric Lee and and uh, uh, what he's doing with uh, uh, the blockchain. Um, he's definitely one of the uh, one of the guys that's out there doing the work and and uh, uh, putting things forward with Hub Token. Uh, can't wait to get to him. Uh, but let's uh, I digress. Um, a couple of other things that are being said. Um, oh yeah. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, and this is a this was very interesting. This is an article that appeared in Healthcare IT News. And I think every time that I, I hear the term healthcare IT news, I kind of I kind of sleep a little bit. You know, it's not really sexy. It's not really something that you would think would be great and and uh, something that uh, everyone wants to think about. But uh, they're starting to think about blockchain in a very way and in a very interesting way. Um, and this article that is a recent article, February 19th, um, uh, in Healthcare News, says, as much hype as there be, has been around blockchain and Bitcoin, as an architecture for distributed but trustworthy record keeping, blockchain could turn out to be underhyped in the long run. I think that's the first time I've heard the term underhyped being uh, uh, associated with blockchain and 
and uh, cryptocurrencies. It, it everyone is feeling that uh, uh, the you know the the hype out there and the hype sites are really getting up to ICOs and tokens and things of this nature. But someone else is beginning to realize in the healthcare industry. Any any of you programmers out there, if you guys are programmers or are listening to this, man, this is a great opportunity. This this is a change that. Uh, uh, will be recorded in history. The people that are working on this kind of stuff, uh, you know, the, the, the MIT graduates 20 years from now will be looking back at what we were doing and, and dissecting what the, all these all these people that are doing like Eric and, and uh, moving forward in healthcare, moving forward with the distributed ledger. Um, once again, just really quickly for some of you, some of you don't know, and, and uh, we do uh, post these on um, um, uh, LinkedIn or on uh, YouTube. Uh, and if you go to YouTube and type in Blockchain Weekly, you'll be able to see our channel and be able to look at a couple of the um, uh, the, the past recordings. Also, Blockchain Weekly is a weekly broadcast that happens 2 o'clock uh, Eastern Central Time. It's noon Phoenix, Arizona time every single week when we get together and we do these kinds of discussions uh, and have interesting guests like Eric on it. So just, you know, shameless plug there. Know where to go. Come here every Wednesday. Go to um, um, YouTube and take a look at it. But one of the things that, that, that we're doing is we're, we're talking about, uh, we have a question. And Eric is not even on here, but we have a question. I want to get to it. Oh, um, uh, so Eric is not on here. I'm going to answer this question. Do you recommend any good papers or articles on blockchain impact on data management and quality? Um, uh, uh, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that's happening out there with um, uh, with oh, Eric's coming on board. You want to answer that, Eric? Boy, we're getting all kinds of stuff happening today. Eric, how are you? I'm doing well. I've been here listening to your spiel. Uh, it's nice I, to be with everyone here. It, I, 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 think you should, I think you should go ahead. I think you should go ahead and answer the question. I'll try to chime oh. in too. Okay. Well, I, I'm glad that you have great ideas. So do you recommend any good papers on articles on blockchain impact on data management and quality? Um, I, I think that's a great, great question. I think that some of the stuff that I've read is, is uh, as it comes out, becomes outdated. Uh, the problem that we're having with the supply chain, uh, transportation and logistics is it's happening so quickly and so fast. And we have this new thing called EDL, which basically tracks uh, tractor trailers and tracks uh, the drivers and things of this nature. At the same time, we've got this, 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 strange guy over at Tesla. What was his name again? <laughs> Who's bringing out tractors that uh, are driverless. Um, and we're beginning to bifurcate the transportation sector into a local hall, into a, uh, a place where the tractors are stored, uh, uh, and then a long haul, which basically will be uh, headless and, and uh, be automated. So lots of things that we can talk about and things I could point you to uh, but nothing really that's going to be relevant uh, by this time next week, it seems like. There are some interesting companies out there. Um, Ship Chain is one. Um, SHIP Chain, Intelligent, uh, Decentralized, and Secure. Uh, Aaron Kelly uh, is a gentleman I've met from Ship Chain. That is shipchain.io. Um, they ha undoubtedly have a white paper there. Um, I would look at uh, Ship Chain. Um, Rick um, is the CEO for a company called uh, Lane Access, and I believe it's laneaccess.io. They're doing interesting things in automated, uh, automating the, um, uh, the, the, the flow of transportation, uh, and they're doing it in kind of a different way. They're looking at making um, uh, basically a marketplace where truckers can look for loads and things of this nature, and they're taking the broker out, out of the, the mix and automating some of that. So um, there's a couple of good websites. I would do a, a Google search and, and look at uh, current events, and when I would do a Google search on that, I would do the special Google search and set the, the, uh, uh, the search options to you know something in the last week or so, uh, just to make sure that you're getting current information. And, and Eric, what would you like to add? Uh that was great information. Uh, I would say that uh, it's it's hard for me to think of uh, kind of reference information right now, because uh, so much of it is being invented uh, right now. So I would uh, just point you to uh, some of the white papers that uh, various projects have been 
working on. I mean, that's really kind of the state of the art uh, right now. And uh, I know some of those white papers, you know, they're uh, pretty, uh, pretty good for bedtime reading. And, um, but it's, uh, it's good to uh, try to make your way through those. And, um, you know, if you really want to get an understanding, uh, definitely look through those. It's, it's an exciting time because uh, really the kind of the art and science around uh, how blockchain can be used is uh, happening just as we speak. Yeah, Dan, I, uh, Dan Myers, uh, thank you for the question. And um, you've, you've got it answered and, and everyone else that's out there. Um, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. There's question marks. We can get you up on the video. Uh, we haven't done that uh, yet in a while, but we can actually have someone come up and, and ask questions and be on the video. Lots of things going on here, lots of ways of doing it. Michael McCockless, thank you so much for um, uh, providing this great uh, opportunity and this great uh, background uh, where we can meet and talk about blockchain kinds of stuff uh, once a week. Uh, Eric, I, 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 uh, I have to admit, I'm, 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 I'm honored to speak with you. I'm honored to uh, engage with you. And uh, uh, thank you so much with, for everything that you're doing. Um, uh, and we're, let's, let's dive into a little bit about what you're doing in love, but let's not talk about hub token right away. Let's talk about, um, something that, uh, is interesting and it is called, it's the, um, the Dunbar number, because I think you have interesting things that you are going to basically make capable on a Dunbar number and being able to transfer trust and spread that Dunbar number out to where you could actually uh, communicate and have trust between people on a, on a, on a different level. Does that make sense? So let's talk about, you know, that's, that's what I see the issue is, is the Dunbar number, right? Does that make sense? Or am I just a mad scientist here? You're probably a mad scientist, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I'd like to talk about the Dunbar number. It's a uh, you know, okay. pretty interesting number. I believe that uh, Malcolm Gladwell uh, popularized it in his, uh, in his book. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, basically the, the idea behind the Dunbar number is uh, Dun Dunbar was uh, an anthropologist and he, he'd like to study, you know, uh, uh, you know, chimpanzees and, and, and so forth. And so he, he had this uh, observation that, um, you know, at any given moment, our, our, our real social network, you know, the people that we uh, really um, interact with uh, in the offline world uh, is, is really uh, just around uh, 150 people or so. So there's a kind of a limit that we as humans with our Cognitive abilities uh, can only kind of have relationships, uh, kind of meaningful relationships with uh, 150 uh, people at any given moment. And of course, you know, new people come in, you know, people people leave, you know, as we're kind of losing losing track of them. But uh, this is kind of based on some kind of um, uh, you know old old world uh, you know hardwiring that we have in our brains that uh, say that we can only kind of you know do this and. Uh, so it was, it was an interesting observation uh, because that uh, 150 number kind of seems to pop up everywhere. So, for example, if you're working in a in a in a company, uh, you you can kind of you know grow to the size of you know let's say 150 employees before uh, you 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 know lose track of you know uh, knowing everyone in in the company. So in organizations uh, and in larger companies. There's really this kind of limit that we all seem to uh, fall under uh, in terms of how effectively we, you know, deal with people. Yeah. So anytime that uh, Intel has a group or a division that gets to be about 150, 200 people, they they split it off into a different division and, and give it different exactly. uh, abilities. Um, and, and yeah, any any organization that, that that's at that point begins, uh, tends to start cavitating. It, it's an interesting number. It definitely is an interesting number, and it's it's probably you know some kind of limit that's kind of uh, determined by our uh, cognitive uh, you know limitations as uh, carbon-based life forms. Yes, we are carbon-based. <laughs> <laughs> so we have but to deal with it. We we seem to be capable of of harnessing intelligent or artificial intelligence here fairly quickly. So uh, that's uh, that's saying something for us. 
Um, so you you um, you co-founded LinkedIn. Tell me a little bit about that. Let's let's get that out of the way. Yeah. So uh, I I did uh, was was one of the co-founders of uh, you know LinkedIn, which uh, hopefully uh, everybody here uh, is uh, a member of. And um, we you know started uh, boy 15, 16 years ago. Uh, during the time when uh, really all the social networks uh, came to being, uh, Twitter and Facebook, uh, at least the, the, the original ones. And um, it was a very uh, you know, interesting time because I think what LinkedIn, uh, one of the companies uh, that was trying to basically you know, put people online. Before that, you know, there were a lot of websites around uh, you know, information, directories. You could go visit the Smithsonian online. Uh, but the whole concept of, you know, could you have people online uh, and, and, you know, not just kind of sell things to people, you know, via e-commerce sites, uh, but could you have people online and uh, give them a way to uh, interact with each other? Uh, that, that was kind of novel at, at that time. And uh, so uh, as, as we've seen, that experiment really did work. And, uh, you know, people are, you know, looking at all sorts of different avenues to uh, interact with each other. And there's myriad ways online to, uh, for people to, uh, you know, to, to connect with each other and, uh, you know, to interact. And, you know, of course, LinkedIn was really kind of all about the professional interactions and uh, enabling people to uh, discover uh, each other. Uh, and, uh, the way that we got to it, just to share a little bit of a, a story, was that um, the, the, the basic idea was pretty simple, which was, um, uh, and it maybe relates back to the Dunbar number uh, in some ways, because uh, we, uh, you know, out here in Silicon Valley, you know, there's a lot of uh, people moving around all the time from one company to another, to one project to another. And we were all just trying to keep track of our network. Where, where are people? Uh, you know, where, what company are they at now? Where, where did they move? And the reason for why that's valuable is, uh, you know, if uh, when somebody you know goes to uh, a, a new company, may, maybe you want to, you know, find out about that. Maybe you want to, uh, you know, find out about what they're working on. Uh, maybe you want to have a partnership with them. So keeping track of where your network is is definitely valuable. And uh, we didn't have a tool to do that at the time. And uh, yep. so we said, well, why don't we create something? that allows us to, you know, kind of join it and uh, have people as they're, you know, moving around, they could update their profiles and uh, we could get notifications about where people uh, went. And um, in case it was interesting, we could, of course, reach out to them and, and uh, you know, catch up and, and so forth. And so that was really the basic idea behind LinkedIn. Yeah, there's. Uh, I, I was there during that time. I mean, there was, there was opportunities where you had a relationship with someone um, uh, you, they were a, a resource or, um, they were a trusted partner. Um, uh, they were a consultant, something of this nature. You had their business phone number and their business email address. Um, they changed businesses and all of a sudden they were lost. Uh, and, and we found in LinkedIn that we could connect, uh, and then we could keep track of one another and then we could start building these, uh, uh, these networks of people to where we, we, it, it, we wouldn't lose this, the, um, uh, the opportunity to connect. Um, and thank you very much for that. For that, um, I, I know that I'm on LinkedIn. I know that I use LinkedIn a lot. And thank you very much. Uh, uh, it has uh, provided me with a lot of resources, and I really appreciate it. Oh, I, 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 I did have. I do have a pending request to connect with you. So if you'd like to connect, please, please feel free to. <laughs> I'm surprised we By haven't done. I'll do it right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyway, so um, uh, now we have uh, an interesting thing where we're in this area where. You know, uh, LinkedIn is on B to C, and Facebook is on, or uh, Facebook is B to uh, business to consumer, and LinkedIn is the B to B kind of resources for us. And social media, we can reach out, we can connect, and we can do things and and uh, uh, move our resources around and and uh, build applications. Great stuff. Now we have a different situation where we're beginning to have these huge, huge, massive um, uh, followings. Uh, I think the the limit on LinkedIn is three thousand five hundred. Um, and you can have this, you know, email lists out there, crazy email lists, and they become uh, depersonalized and they become less interesting as far as engagement is concerned. Um, and uh, a lot of the reason why, why that is is because there's there's a lack of trust, right? 
you don't know who that is. It just be it's just someone on my email list. It's just someone on my LinkedIn. I've got two thousand people on my LinkedIn. I can't keep track of who they are. And and when we start getting uh, getting uh, involved and in a relationship, it, it's difficult to keep track of who we are, what we're trusting, and 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 this is kind of kind of the solution that you're proposing here, right? Yeah, that that, that that's right. Um, you know, I, I, I've I've heard on numerous occasions that you know people. You know they have these big networks, uh, whether it's on LinkedIn or, or other places. Maybe you know Twitter. Twitter is uh, really great at allowing people to follow you, and um, and, and and so you know what, what I've heard is well, I, I have such trouble keeping track of all, all these folks that I've you know met at one point or another in the past, and um, you know uh, I, I can kind of only keep track of a small group of people who I have kind of tight relationships with at any given time. And so that goes back to the Dunbar uh, number concept. Um, so, I mean, what, what's happened is that uh, technology has given us, you know, these great avenues for um, coming into contact with many, many more people besides the, you know, 150, you know, limit. Um, but it, it hasn't gone beyond that to help us figure out how we can have you know, better, closer relationships with, um, you know, more people. So we don't want to lose track or we don't want to lose the ability to not keep in touch with, um, you know, to keep in touch with many more people. We want to keep that. That's an advantage. But how, how can we, you know, solve the problem of uh, being able to interact uh, in more meaningful ways with uh, more people? And uh, so again, you know, uh, is is there a way, you know, for technology to, you know, help us with that? And and so, one of the most kind of fundamental uh, ways that you know people interact with each other is on the basis of uh, trust. And trust has um, is the foundation on which you know people, two people or a group of people. Um, you know, have uh, meaningful relationships uh, with uh, one another. And uh, so we believe that's that's very fundamental. It's very fundamental if we're to uh, continue to want to interact with other people online, which we want to do. Uh, but then, again, how do we make things better so that we can have more uh, meaningful, impactful relationships uh, with uh, other people online at scale? At scale, and that's what, at scale. So that's that's what uh, that's what uh, you know. What that's what we're trying to do. Lots of applications for this. I mean, um, you know, there's there's things where uh, websites where you go and you comment and and you have, um, uh, you know, let's look at Amazon, right? Amazon, you 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 sell stuff on Amazon, um, and you always look for. Uh, people with five stars or four stars. So there's some there's some sort of implicit uh, meaning in the value of the stars that we have on Amazon. Um, can this be faked? Yeah, fairly easy. You know, um, it, it, you know if you've got if you've got three or four people that have given you a five star rating, guess what you rate. Um, and if you're out there and and it's not necessarily um, uh, not necessarily. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're, we got a question in there, but we don't have a question. Um, if if you're buying something on Amazon, who do you trust, right? If you're buying something on eBay, you know, the eBay is the quintessential uh, smart contract, right? Um, how do we trust the people that, we, uh, that we're buying from? I, I, I give the story of I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I want to buy a, a, a 65 um, uh, Ford pickup truck, right? There's a lot of cowboys in Phoenix, Arizona that want to buy the same pickup truck. I, my budget's 10,000 and I can only find one for 15,000. What am I going to do? I find one in Detroit, Michigan. It's 8,500. That's a great opportunity, right? So let's, let's get in there and let's get that. Now, um, uh, right now I can send him the 8,500 and never see my money, never see the pickup, right? <laughs> or I can fly out to Detroit, Michigan right? And hope that the, the, the pickup makes it back, or I can use a thing called escrow.com. Escrow.com is a quantitative analysis, right? It's a, uh, Escrow.com says, did you receive a pickup? So I enter into an agreement with escrow.com, and he, he says, okay, great. So now uh, we, we, uh, uh, we, he's getting ready to send it. The day before he sends it, his brother comes in and says, look, my pickup truck has the same tires as yours, right? 
and mine are bald. Yours are not. Can we switch them out? He says, well, let's see, I have a, at the end of this, I have a quantitative analysis, not a qualitative. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So they switch them out and they leave the window down because they don't really care because there's no quantitative analysis. So I get my pickup truck. It has bald tires. There's mildew in the cab because they left the window open. Right. And escrow.com says quantitative analysis. Did you get a pickup truck? Yes, I did. So, boom, I'm stuck. Right. Um, and, and there's a trust that goes along with it. Right. If 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 you had a smart contract and we we've, we've played around with this. So smart contract says, look, it, it, it costs 150 bucks to transport this from Detroit to Phoenix. So I'm going to take $8,500 in coin, put it in a smart contract. I'm going to take $150 in coin and put it in a smart contract. And Mr. Seller, you take $150 in coin and put it in the, in the same smart contract. We set the smart contract up to pay a transportation company. Transportation company picks it up and delivers it. And at the end of the at the end of the transaction, I have the opportunity to take a look at it and go yes or no. If I go no, if it if the tires are bald and there's mildew in the cab, then I have the opportunity to use my hundred and fifty dollars to send it back to him. I'll get my eight thousand five hundred back. So there's a quantitative and a qualitative analysis. And what you're trying to do uh, with Hub is kind of give this qualitative analysis for people and human beings and relationships and what they're doing and and, and what the level of trust is uh what's the, the implicit trust is there a, a, you know a, and let's talk about this a little bit how do you come up about this in hub is there a a peer group and how and how do we take how do we uh locate the peer group how do we make a peer group a true peer group and not uh something that's just you know basically a sock puppet out there that kind of stuff does that make sense yeah, I, I yeah. mean, the, the, the example that you just described, uh, you know, describes actually pretty well uh, what, uh, you know, our project uh, is, is uh, basically about. Uh, you know, there, there, there's some, you know, kind of tweaks that we're making here and there uh, to make things more interesting. Well. You, <laughs> yeah, but uh, <laughs> you, you basically uh, described it uh, pretty perfectly. And, and uh, um, you know, in terms of you know the kind of make it more interesting, the fact that you know you you've described a process where you know you're using an escrow to sort of make sure that you know you as a buyer get you know what you uh, intend to intend to get, and there are some um, uh, you know sort of inefficiencies in that process today. You've got to sign up with this other uh, firm. You've got to you know put some you know money down, and and certainly we our our project you know wants to support scenarios exactly like yours but we also see that there's an opportunity that we can bring this kind of uh behavior or interaction to uh things that are much you know finer and more granular where the inefficiencies of uh you know today's processes uh can uh, basically be reduced or maybe eliminated it's just part of the whole interaction uh so instead of you know buying a um you know buying a uh uh, a vehicle, you know, for example, uh, you could, you know, use it to, you know, buy a buy a very small, you know, sort of thing, um, uh, and uh, you, you know, have the same tools, uh, you know, at your uh, disposal. And um, we have this idea of, uh, 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 you know, called staking, which is a pretty central concept in uh, what we're doing uh, on the blockchain, where basically people are, you know, putting up a uh, bond, if you will, and it can be expressed in, in tokens, so it's very efficient and very fast, uh, where they're basically promised to fulfill their end of the bargain. And assuming everything goes well, uh, everybody uh, you know gets their uh, bond back and is rewarded uh, even more so uh, for that. Um, and so in that way, we incentivize people to act in uh, trustworthy ways. Uh, but one of the interesting things also is that we have built into the whole concept, this idea of when things don't go well and how do you resolve, uh, you know, disputes. And so we have the concept of uh, arbiters who can, you know, kind of come into a situation. They can look at, you know, what's uh, happened uh, among all the different parties and, um, uh, you know, help the parties, help the interaction, figure out, you know, who was, you know, right. It isn't always a uh, black and white question, of course, so you need some uh, intelligence in, in that, whether it's uh, the artificial kind or the human kind. 
Um, uh, and then, of course, the, you know, this kind of uh, leads to the question is, well, how, how trustworthy uh, is the arbiter in, in this case? And so we've got a good answer to that. We, we say that, well, they, they too have uh, kind of a trustworthiness associated with them that can be uh, represented in the system. And uh, so there's a self-referential aspect to uh, what, you know, makes a trustworthy arbiter versus one that, you know, maybe is not uh, so reliable and just maybe, you know, flips a coin and, and uh, you know, makes one side win. So uh, there, there are some interesting wrinkles about that that, you know, we believe will also help um, settle interactions uh, between, you know, people and uh, bring about more kind of trustworthy interactions uh, in uh, online uh, among people and users. So, um, did uh, are you trying to, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but are you trying to bring proof of stake into relationships? Is that basically? <laughs> 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 well, there is this. Uh, I have to be careful with that term because uh, proof, proof yeah. of stake certainly, yeah. you know, is a is a pretty uh, you know loaded term these days. But we we are uh, very interested in the whole concept of um, you know staking or uh, having people you know as as part of their interaction, kind of put something you know on the line. Uh, because I, I think one of the problems that is pretty prevalent today online is that um, people have nothing to lose. People, uh, you know, have nothing really at stake when they put out a piece of information or uh, have a transaction uh, where uh, they have little or nothing to lose. And, and, and that's what leads to, I think, uh, some of the abuses or maybe a lot of the abuses that we're, you know, seeing, you know, online. People are, um, you know, uh, spamming each other. They're, you know, contacting each other without... Uh, uh, thought and and so as a result, uh, you you just have a lot of uh, wasted you know uh, attention uh, on everybody's part. People are kind of forced to you know look at these messages and uh, a few seconds here and there kind of adds up to you know a lot of time. And uh, we're not even talking about you know uh, fake information uh, and fake news that you know where people are intentionally putting. Uh, false information and uh, trying to, you know, mislead people. Uh, so there's been, you know, kind of a lot of that uh, talk in the press recently about how, you know, fake news and, um, you know, fake, uh, you know, ads and so forth uh, really have had some very, um, you know, negative effects on, um, you know, us and the way that we run as a, as a country. And there's really no stake that they have that they're willing to lose. I'm I'm fighting a battle right now with YouTube about some of uh, the copyright uh, that I that I have in these interviews, right? Because I've I've got someone who is <clears throat> I don't know mentally ill or unstable or something that's claiming he he has copyright to to my stuff, and that YouTube keeps on pulling it down and giving me copyright strikes. And and this person really has no not, no basis whatsoever, but he keeps on continuing to. To harass and harangue me, so um, uh, you know it, it, it's an issue. It's a problem if you don't have stake. And, and so, uh, and, and we have an interesting question here. I wanted to get back to that. I don't want to get lost in in uh, uh, in, in that bright shiny object because I'll get angry, and I don't want to be angry. <laughs> but going back to the arbitrators, yeah, 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 yeah. No, never mind. <laughs> I, uh, Correct. We don't have to go there. Yeah, we, okay. So, um, and, and going back to the arbitrators, um, and I got a question we're going to pop up uh, right now. Let, let me go ahead and get John. John Crockett, by the way, is one of the partners in Blockchain Consultants. That's a blockchainconsultants.io. We help people do a lot of this kind of stuff. So, how are arbitrators chosen or assigned, and how does one become an arbitrator? John wants to become an arbitrator. I, I, I know John. I'm sure he wants to become an arbitrator. But uh, let's talk a little bit about this. Is it community? Is it, uh, you know, how does proof of stake um, uh, key into this? And and uh, what are some of your thoughts with this, Eric? Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, we we haven't totally figured it out yet. Is is the honest answer. But uh, we've got some ideas for how um, you know it would come about and. So, you know, one of the important things that we, we have to, you know, do with the protocol is, is, is to uh, really kind of bootstrap it, you know, from, you know, no users uh, to, you know, some, some users. And 
when you're when you're talking about arbiters, they are really in this class, you know, of, of users that we call experts. And in this case, arbiters are experts at uh, arbitration. And so, how how do you find the experts in any kind of uh, you know community? Well, um, they they are the ones that basically you know have some kind of you know trust, uh, more more trust uh, you know in a certain community than than other uh, people. Uh, and we argue that uh, that there are arbit arbiters in uh, of many different kinds, uh, and and they are unique individuals uh, in, in many different you know communities. So not an ar you know, not one arbiter can be an arbiter in, in many different kinds of uh, communities. Um, and so we, we're looking for those experts. And um, the, you know the way that we would do that is we would we would again find the people that are you know most trustworthy uh, as we are keeping track of the you know, most trustworthy sort of individuals uh, in uh, any any given community. And they they basically can, you know, elect themselves uh, or the community itself has some kind of, you know, governance uh, mechanism where, where they say, well, you know, we, we require, you know, people to have a certain amount of trustworthiness before that, you know, they, we can accept them to be um, an, an arbiter. So there's, there's kind of a, you know, buildup, if you will, of people who, um, are motivated to become arbiters and for the community to, you know, set certain, you know, criteria uh, for them, you know, for uh, there to be uh, arbiters uh, in their community. And so, you know, that that's a process that we, you know, want to uh, facilitate and encourage in the communities that, you know, we would be supporting with uh, our protocol. Um, and, um, and, and, and so the idea is that, uh, you know, once these arbiters, uh, you know, be, become, you know, part of the community, they then also, you know, kind of amass uh, trust as, as a result of arbitrating um, disputes. Um, the, one of the motivations for becoming an arbiter is that uh, there is a incentive to, you know, help uh, resolve disputes. So that's a, a kind of a natural function for, you know, people who, are interested in you know arbitrating and uh, you know wanting to to do that. So what we, we so we believe that you know there's going to be kind of a, a class of people who who want to do this because it's uh, economically uh, beneficial to do it. So it's kind of a wiki page, um, maybe mixed a little bit with WikiLeaks and maybe mixed a little bit with uh, uh, proof of stake and. Uh, I like the the fact that you're bringing community into it because I think that's that's where it's all going to 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 to, to hinge on. How do we uh, how do we keep track of the the trust? You know, and and you know we're involved in these smart contracts, and uh, what they do well is they transfer trust. But uh, you know, uh, just really quickly uh, for people that haven't that are that are new to us, we look at uh, you know the internet. Internet happened 20 years. The next one was the Internet of Data, and and uh, uh, we have the Internet of Data that is already taking place, and if you don't believe me, you know, go to Google and type in Bagel Puppies, and then uh, go to Facebook, and all of a sudden you'll see ads about Beagle Puppies, and then you know, do the same thing on your on your phone and all your other devices, and all of a sudden you're seeing all these things about Beagle Puppies. So it, it's the hashes that we have, it's the Internet of Data, it's already happened, we already know who you are. Um, resistance is futile, right? Uh, <laughs> so then we had the, the internet of things and, and uh, you know, someone said to you, look, your, uh, your, your, your refrigerator is going to tell you, uh, is going to tell Amazon that you need milk and Amazon is going to send it to you. And we all laughed. We thought that was as funny as we could possibly be. And then about eight years later, give or take a couple, uh, you know, you're in Home Depot and you had the Samsung there with a the screen on the front that would, you know, contact Amazon and, and tell you that uh, the milk was done. So that was the Internet of Things. Then we had the Internet of, of, uh, of uh, uh, value, right? And that was Bitcoin, Bitcoin and all these kinds of stuff. We could and we can now transfer value on the Internet and do it very quickly and very swiftly. That was very interesting. The most interesting one that we have is now what we're involved in with smart contracts and some of the things that you're talking about are, are, are very important for this. Um, and it's it, it's all about the internet of of trust and and how do we transfer trust on the internet from one person to another? Um, transferring trust, we can we can do that. We can do that very easily. And in the the uh, the, the demonstration I've given you, the example I've given as far as uh, uh, the pickup truck, I mean that you, you're transferring trust basically. Um, and there's and it's done basically with a proof of stake. 
So we can transfer trust, but how do we keep track of the transfer of trust? How do we keep track of the transfer of trust over a period of time so that we can begin to build a reputation, right? That's what you're working on. Um, reputation is important. We, we started doing it a little bit, I think, with there was a, a, a website out there called Clout, uh, and we could look at different types of social media and look at behavior on different types of media and come up with a, a relative uh, value as far as uh, your clout. Uh, that became more of a popularity contest, I think, and lost value over time. Um, in as, as opposed to having uh, keeping track of, of trust, it became, you know, keeping track of, you know, um, uh, uh, of your ego <laughs> and people started gaming it and things of this nature, um, you know, and, and, and that's going to happen. But I, I think you're working on some very interesting things um, and, and very necessary things as we move forward into this, uh, uh, this relationship where we're, um, we're branching out, we're, we're making more connections. We're talking to more people. We're, we're broadening our sphere of influence, right? Uh, one of the things that, that really impresses me, um, and it impresses me to no end, and, and I, I'm very thankful that, I, that uh, I'm alive in these interesting times, is that uh, we have at our hand, um, you know, when we sit here and we talk about the Internet and the, the types of technology that we have available, the types of data that we have available, uh, you know, we have at our fingertips more data, more information, more technology than uh, many many generations before us, cumulative total for the entire generation. Um, that, that brings along with a great responsibility. When you can do great things, there's great responsibility also. And how do we take care of that? How do we, how do we monitor trust? How do we monitor who people are? How do, we, how do we get rid of the bad players? And then how do, we get, how, do, how do we keep the bad players from popping up other places, right? There's a thing called sock. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's really exciting about you know blockchain and you know there's there's been a lot of you know hype around uh, Bitcoin and other you know cryptocurrencies and so forth and so there's a fair amount of uh, you know speculation that goes on uh, around you know what's uh, you know this coin going to be worth uh, tomorrow or or next year and so forth. Uh, but one of the really exciting things about blockchain uh, because it is a a medium of uh, value exchange. Is that it, it? It really can rewrite the rules of how we operate in in, uh -huh. in society, right? Um, not only in terms of how people interact with each other, but how um, organizations, like you know, companies, interact with uh, people, uh, and other organizations, you know, interact with uh, with people. And that's that 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 that's frankly just kind of you know mind blowing. So what, one of the you know I think issues today is that you have um, Really, an incentive system that has been, you know, set up. You know, co corporations are uh, very, you know, are are profit, you know, driven, uh, and uh, you know, users uh, don't, uh, people don't have a lot of uh, power in the digital, you know, realm because they uh, actually all of their data are, are owned by these, you know, large companies. Is that there? There is a really a misalignment of uh, incentives, right? Uh, companies are trying to maximize their profit and. Uh, Often they're doing it at the expense of uh, their users. They're, they're keeping track of their users on. Uh, just last night I was having dinner with a friend and uh, we talked a lot about how all of these um, you know, systems, especially the social networks, are geared towards keeping you on their website um, you know, for the longest time possible because if you're on their website, uh, you know, the better chance they have to you know, monetize, right? Um, you, you, you go to Netflix and you you watch, uh, you know, you, you intend to watch one episode of a show and you end up, you know, being there for six hours because, you know, they just keep feeding you the, the, the you know, the movies and the videos and the shows that, uh, you know, keep you, keep you on board. And, and so uh, there really is a conflict there in terms of the motivations of, uh, you know, organizations versus people. And what... Um, the, the, really, the promise of blockchain and why it's so exciting—it's beyond the you know technological uh, you know solutions—is the promise that we can we can rework this whole system so that the incentives you know of people you know between people are uh, better aligned, right? And uh, hopefully, we can we can make uh, a lot of things that are ills that we have today. Uh, the time that we spend on social media, the you know the fact that uh, users are the 
products themselves, uh, those, those things uh, can be, you know, made uh, better. And uh, we, we can move to a, a world where, uh, you know, the technology is, isn't really controlling us, but we're actually, you know, using it for, uh, for value, uh, for things that we actually want to do. Uh, so I think technology, you know, in the success of the first internet has really gotten uh, away from us. And uh, I think blockchain really has a lot of promise to uh, get back to, uh, you know, kind of fundamental, you know, value systems that, you know, we as people, you know, want to, want to have and want to control. So that's exciting. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. That, very, very well put. Uh, um, you know, centralization is decentral. It, it, it's decentralizing everything, right? Right now, we live in a centralized environment where um, um, uh, I, I don't know. I don't want to get political, but you know, uh, we used to be a, 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 a nation of the people for the people and by the people, and we become a nation of the company uh, for the corporations for the profit and by the special interest groups. Um, and if you don't believe me, just open your eyes and look around. Uh, individual liberties, individual rights are being usurped on a daily basis. I'm 59 years old. I grew up in a different world. Um, and every day I see uh, uh, freedoms being taken away. Um, and not that, uh, you know, not that I'm anti-government or anything. I'm just, I, I am, uh, I'm for you, I'm for me, and I'm for the individual. And individual liberties should trump out. That's what our founding fathers um, uh, intended, I'm sure. And there's not a whole lot of that, that that we see in today's environment. And as we begin to decentralize, right, we have these centralized environments that uh, are reacting. And, um, you know, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but I, I've come up with a thing I'm calling Noel's Law. And uh, my name's Michael Noel, right? And uh, <laughs> Noel's, law, Noel's Law has become, um, when confronted with a decentralized mechanism, the first thing that a centralized organization will do is try and centralize it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have another one for you, Michael, which uh, I read sure. a few months ago, which uh, is sort of along the same lines, which was uh, has always been intriguing to me. So I wanted to share it, which is that uh, uh, I, I, I read it somewhere in a in a in a paper, uh, and but the quote is that uh, everything that uh, can be decentralized. Um, will be decentralized. So just, so just think about that for a moment. You know, there, there are many centralized things today, but if you can imagine that there's a decentralized version of that thing, of that organization, oh, yeah. uh, that structure, oh, yeah. um, you know, the, 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 the path, the, the, the natural path is for those things to become decentralized. So you're, you're looking at an incredible potential of, things that are centralized now that, you know, have inefficiencies because they are centralized uh, to uh, become, you know, more efficient, you know, more democratized uh, in a decentralized format. Um, that, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's how, you know, massive this whole kind of idea behind blockchain is. There, there's there's a group of us, and obviously you're included, that feel that this is one of the, the biggest things that have, have happened to mankind is this whole democratization and decentralization um, and this movement that we have going forward. And yeah, um, I, I believe that, that anything that can be decentralized or should be decentralized will become decentralized. So, but, it, but then we have, now we have decisions about how do we move this forward um, how do we do this? I mean, uh, you know, Silk Road was is an example of something that wanted to be decentralized, right? But went down a, a different path, right? How do we how do we do this? You know, that's that's part of the questions, and it's awesome to have thought leaders like yourself um, involved in this. It's awesome to have Hub uh, as uh, you know an example of things that can be and, and and moving forward. Can you tell us a little bit about the rollout and? It's uh, it, it's getting pretty close to the top of the hour. I think we we uh, we, we actually went a, a, a little into the beginning of the hour, so we probably have some time. But tell us a little bit about Hub. Let's uh, let's do some shameless um, you know promotion here about <laughs> Hub. What, what, what would you like us to do? How can we help you? What uh, what's it going to look like? How can we benefit? Let's talk a little bit about Hub. Well, we're we're really excited about our, our project, and uh, you know we're always looking uh, to build a 
community of interested parties who uh, you know want to keep track of the project, but ultimately you know can uh, become uh, you know participants in our great experiment around decentralizing you know trust. And um, you know we we believe uh, that uh, you know shipping is really important. That uh, you know we we can't keep you know talking about these great idealistic ideas uh, and, and not turn them into reality. So we're really focused on how we can, you know, deliver, uh, you know, this technology to people uh, just as soon as we can. Um, and so we're, you know, working, working hard, we're overcoming some of the limitations that exist uh, right now in, in blockchain. And um, in, in uh, you know, the next couple of months, we, we will have something that, you um, will uh, be be out there and uh, our kind of first proof of concept is uh, a application it's a reputation system around uh, believe it or not be- uh, ICOs and uh, we believe that that's a space that uh, is is in need of trust and uh, we want to prove that our protocol has value so we should be able to do something uh, effective in the ICO space and representing um, you know, trust and reputation uh, around ICO projects. So that's what we're going to, what? Yeah, let's do that. ICO, that's, that's a great place to start, you know, and then let's talk about political, let's talk about political contribution. (laughs) And I mean, there's lots of things that we can do, right? It, 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 it starts to get really interesting really fast uh, because, you know, the challenges that exist today around ICOs are, you know, challenges that exist elsewhere, too. So we can take those uh, learnings that we've had and apply them to other domains, uh, you know, as, as well. Um, so we're working towards kind of a, a, a next uh, generation um, uh, professional, uh, you know, messenger that we'll have uh, later on in the year. And uh, it'll be the kind of the um, unification of a lot of ideas that we've had, uh, also built on top of our you know protocol, but but hopefully making it very accessible for the everyday user so that they can engage in you know trustworthy interactions and uh, transactions that uh, people have. And uh, so we you know have a Telegram group, uh, just like many other okay. blockchain projects, and right. uh, you can join us at. Um, t.me slash uh, hub token, H-U-B token. So uh, give us a shot. We, we try to, you know, be very engaged with the community and uh, two-way dialogue with uh, as many people as possible. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And thank you so much. I want to I want to I, I bring Mike uh, up. Mike, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, come up. He's got a video question for you, Eric. Um, and, and anyone else have a video question, you can go ahead and answer it. This is interactive. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Hey, guys. Hey, Eric. Um, yeah, so a quick question. It's more sort of generic, I guess, but it, it popped through on sort of in, in the chat area there. Or someone submitted, maybe they didn't want to come up on stage. But the question was, when did you first realize, let's, you know, that this sort of blockchain was a real thing that is something that you wanted to get involved with. And what do you see as the time frame where this might become more sort of mainstream? Because there's a lot of, there's a, if I look at it, there's a ton of people who are trying to get involved in it but don't understand it or, or aren't good. So sort of your, you know, your time and then what, where do you see it becoming more mainstream? Yeah. Uh, so um, I, I, there was a time a, a few months ago, uh, maybe like half a year ago, where uh, I, I just had an epiphany. I was I was trying to you know learn about blockchain and crypto and decentralization, just like you know everybody else. And I, and I, I spent a lot of time reading, uh, getting my hands on white papers and articles as much as I could, and talking to people uh, who were already in the in the work as much as I could. And I, there was one night I just had this realization where all the concepts just kind of um, fell together. And uh, it made me realize that a brilliant group of people came up with um, all these brilliant concepts. And it, it started. Fig- I started figuring out how they all kind of interconnected. Uh, blockchain, you know, crypto, um, uh, decentralization, uh, you know, that's it, it all fit together. And it was at that time that I realized, you know, hey, this this is not a kind of a shallow set of ideas. Uh, this is a really deep set of internally 
consistent, I like to say, set of ideas that is really uh, imagining a whole different world. And and that that's amazing. You know, you, you don't see that kind of set of concepts for, um, you know, uh, maybe you see it once in a generation. And uh, that was really special uh, to, to me. And, and uh, the last time I felt that was really uh, when um, the internet uh, came along uh, back <laughs> in the 90s. And uh, we, right. we've all witnessed and lived what's happened since then. So, you know, what, what does it take to, uh, you know, get it into mainstream hands? We're, we're kind of at that stage, I would say, if we compare it back to the 90s, uh, we're, we're kind of uh, pre-Netscape time, if uh, people in the audience remember what Netscape was. We're, we're, we're a little bit before Netscape. Um, you know, things are percolating, uh, and there's a lot of excitement, but we, we still need to spend quite a lot of time on the technology because it's, you know, pretty raw. So in about two to three years, uh, I believe that, you know, people will be uh, transacting uh, in tokens quite a lot. And, um, you know, whereas I remember, you know, before back in the late 90s, people had to learn what a URL is. Um, <laughs> I predict in two to three years, uh, people will, you know, be very natural with what a token is. So oh, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, and, uh, you know, just a, a quick demonstration there of the Shindig platform. Uh, it's an awesome platform. And, um, you know, uh, Eric, thanks for your insight on that. Two to three years, I think that, uh, um, you know, I think maybe it's, it's, it's even more compressed. I think that we're going to find that, you know, the Internet, Indeed. the Internet, the Internet was 20 years for adoption. Um, the Internet of Things was about eight years for adoption. The Internet of Data was about five. The Internet of Value was about three, and I think we're, I think we're already a year into the Internet of Value. I think 2017 with uh, Vitalik and, and some of the work that he did was really 2014, 2015, and I think uh, it, it gained some popularity in 2016, 2017, and I think we're we're really on the way. As soon as some of us right? Eric, uh, you're included in the us bit. Um, uh, really start to get some some things that are of value and, and out there and working where people are actually transacting and, and um, doing uh, cross-border transactions. I mean, these, this is important, cross-border transactions. When we look, uh, in, and I, I'm, I'm the CEO for Blockchain Consultants, I look at a lot of these projects. I've, I'm going to give everyone a, a quick tool here, right? When you look at a project and you think, is it going to be good for blockchain? One of the things that the first thing I look for is does it transfer trust because it has to transfer trust, right? That's the thing that uh, smart contracts do. If it doesn't transfer trust, forget about it. Number two is, does it have sticky bits? Sticky bits. What do I talk about sticky bits? Well, these are people in the transaction that try and, and grind you, try and change the parameters of the transaction, to try and change things within it to, to benefit them. Uh, sometimes we call them uh, brokers and sometimes we call them agents or sometimes we call them just people that you know, stick up the, the mess and gum up the mess. Um, is there money in the transaction? If there's not money in the transaction, then, um, you know, why do it, you know? And does it make things simpler? Um, uh, the fourth one is, you know, uh, a growth hacker's uh, number one rule, uh, simplify the process or someone else will. So if we look at these four kinds of components and apply them to the, to the transaction that you're doing, um, you can come up with a pretty good idea whether or not uh, it, it, it's going to be a good type of a blockchain uh, project. So please feel free to, to use that kind of stuff, use that kind of uh, um, of a nomenclature when you're looking at blockchain projects. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff going down the pike. Very interesting uh, time. And, you know, as much hype as there is about blockchain and Bitcoin as an architecture for distributed and trustworthy record keeping, blockchain could turn out to be underhyped in the long run. <laughs> Imagine and, that. I, and I think yeah, imagine that. It's underhyped. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, if it's underhyped, then what, what must the value be? And there's other there's a lot of us that feel that um, that's totally appropriate. Eric, I, I, I want to thank you so much, sir, for what you're doing. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for being with us on Blockchain Weekly. And um, uh, there you go. You've wasted another perfectly good hour uh, here on Blockchain Weekly talking about things, all things blockchain. Uh, Mike, I, I want to thank you, and I want to thank Shindig. Um, uh, Eric, I'm sure you'll agree this is a, a, an awesome environment to get together and chat. Uh, we've had some people come in and engage with us, uh, ask questions, got up on the video uh, uh, platform, 
and ask questions. Uh, Shindig is a awesome, awesome, awesome platform. And I invite anyone to reach out to Mike and say, hey, listen, Mike, I, I really want to, to do one of these Shindig things. And uh, how do we get that going and uh, give him your ideas? Mike is awesome, awesome to talk to. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mike. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Shindig. And thank you all for uh, for joining us. If you're joining us uh, live on the Shindig, it happens every Wednesday at two o'clock Eastern Central Time. Uh, that's uh, uh, a noon time in Arizona, uh, Mountain Standard Time. So uh, go to Blockchain Weekly, and uh, there's an instruction set there, blockchainweekly.io. Um, uh, lots of interesting interviews that we've had. Uh, if you go to YouTube and in the little search bar, type in Blockchain Weekly, you'll find the channel and you'll find some uh, some videos that we have there, um, assuming that uh, YouTube hasn't taken me down uh, because, you know, we've, we've got some trust issues out there with people that uh, want to claim copyright. Um, and um, uh, Eric has not been kind enough to um, already have taken care of the problem for me, Eric. I, you know. <laughs> I'll, work, I'll work harder, Mike, just for you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, there. Thank you, sir. And yes, I, I work work harder for all of us because you're you're working on um, a very important portion of this. Is the uh, the the transfer of trust moves forward? How do we keep track of the transfer of trust? How can we set up a distributed ledger, and how do we lens that distributed ledger to find out what the um, uh, not only the authority of, a, of an individual is, but what what are his trust levels and and how do we keep that on a distributed level? This is awesome, awesome stuff. Please, Eric, agree to come back in another couple of weeks when you've made some progress. And can we talk about it then? Yeah, I would love to. I had fun today. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Very good, very good. I had fun too, Eric. It's been a pleasure meeting with you. And um, thanks again, everyone, for being involved. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Eric. And I'm Mike. I'm out. Thanks, Thank you so much, guys.